I want you to hit me as hard as you can. He's the ultimate regular dude who always seems to find himself in a wacky situation or an incredible adventure. Steve Gutenberg is the type of movie star that could only exist in the 80s and part of the 90s. He's a non-threatening nice guy with a charming sense of humor who always seems to find an excuse to take off his shirt. Gutenberg is the type of actor who provides exactly what is needed for the film and the character. No more, no less. He's an icon, a symbol of a more simple time when everyone could get together and laugh at police officers, the elderly, and three men, and a baby, and a g-g-g-g-ghost! And his moment at the top did not last very long, but he made the most of it. Hollywood just can't seem to find a place for this type of actor anymore, but the Sci-Fi Channel sure knows what to do with him. Well, I, I think about quitting show business five times a day um, because it's just a horrible grind. Um, but yeah, did Steve Gutenberg quietly step down from his throne, naturally and peacefully moving on with his life and his career? Or is there a more dark and sinister reason for why Stevie Boy stepped away from the silver screen? Probably not. But let's find out anyway, as we ask the question that's been on everybody's mind since that dog fell in love with that dolphin. What the f*** happened to Steve Gutenberg? That's a stupid question. One question, answer that. It's irrelevant, I won't answer it. Before we begin, I just want to say thanks for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe. And don't forget to click that bell to get notifications, if you're into this kind of stuff. Now, back to the show. But to truly understand what the fuck happened to Steve Gutenberg, we must begin at the beginning, and the beginning began when he was born on his birthday. 1958, Brooklyn, New York. The acting bug would take a big bite out of young Steven in high school. He was greatly inspired by his drama teacher, Mr. Kirby. He would venture off to Los Angeles, and from 1977 to 1980, Steve Gutenberg would work the grind of any up-and-coming actor, filling out his resume with many commercials, advertising all sorts of wonderful material possessions. He had an uncredited role in a movie called Roller Coaster in 1977, as well as starring in a movie called Chicken Chronicles. In addition to appearing in a short-lived sitcom, called No Soap Radio. And Steve Gutenberg claims that he learned how to be humble by working with Sir Lawrence Olivier in the film Boys from Brazil in 1978. <laughs> After appearing in a movie called Players in 1979 and a Village People movie called Can't Stop the Music in 1980, Steve Gutenberg would appear in the incredible ensemble cast in Barry Livingston's directorial debut, Diner. Critics were very impressed with the performances in this film, saying that it felt like the actors had known each other for years, like they weren't acting. This film about friendship has maintained its popularity over the years, with the American Film Institute raking it number 57 on its 100 Funniest Films Ever Made list. And of course, Steve Gutenberg fits right into this perfect cast. Oh, Modell, you're really, really getting me mad now. You, my blood is boiling. Like I'll take a sandwich. No, okay. don't! Fine, I'll take the sandwich. See? See what you do every... He was part of a nuclear holocaust TV movie spectacular the day after in 1983. Then the following year, Steve Gutenberg would headline the film that launched a million sequels, Police Academy, in 1984. Picking up where the Keystone Cops left off, continuing the comedic tradition of funny cops into the annals of cinema. In interviews, Steve Gutenberg says that he didn't try to play the character for anything more than what he was, a party guy who doesn't know what he wants to do with his life. Nothing more, nothing less. Police Academy would go on to become the sixth highest grossing film in 1984, making close to 150 million worldwide off a four and a half million dollar budget. Be back in five minutes! Yes, sir. Shit, I'm deaf. 
Gutenberg would return to the role of Officer Mahoney for three more adventures, 1985's Their First Assignment, 1986 Back in Training, and 1987's Citizens on Patrol. However, scheduling conflicts with other films would keep him from reprising his role. He was in a Sally Field Michael Caine movie called Surrender, and around this time he would star in the Ron Howard classic film Cocoon. Gutenberg absolutely loved this script about aliens who make old people feel young in a magic pool. He loved it so much that he worked for less than his usual fee. Gutenberg really believed in this project. And he believed in its 1988 sequel, Cocoon, The Return, where I'm assuming the cocoons return. Uh. <laughs> the same year that Cocoon came out, 1985, he was in a movie called Bad Medicine, and the next year, 1986, he was in the now classic Short Circuit, which made over $40 million at the box office off a $15 million budget. But Roger Ebert, the guy with the thumbs, was not a big fan of this one, saying that Short Circuit is too cute for its own good. And there was a sequel in 1988, but Gutenberg wasn't in that one, so let's move on. Number five. <laughs> In the late 80s, it was getting about time for Steve Gutenberg to try his hand at more darker material. He'd make his way over into the thriller genre with 1987's The Bedroom Window, but he would still continue to bring the laughs by appearing in Amazon Women on the Moon. The year 1987 would see Steve Gutenberg appear alongside Tom Selleck and Ted Danson in this Spock-directed, massive hit comedy, Three Men and a Baby. This comedy was the highest grossing American film of 1987, making $240 million worldwide off an $11 million budget. Three Men and a Baby remains Steve Gutenberg's highest grossing film to date. And perhaps it was that ghost in the window that helped propel this film to such great heights. You know, like Steve's pal Casper. As many of you know, there's a behind-the-scenes urban legend of Three Men and a Baby that just over an hour into the film, you can see the ghost of a boy who died in the house where it was filmed. However, that was allegedly debunked as the film was shot on a soundstage and the ghost was really a cardboard standee of Ted Danson that was accidentally left on set. Yeah, they want us to believe that. Yeah, right. Critics found that the film Three Men and a Baby mainly worked because the three leads had such great chemistry. Uh, oh, it's giving me a headache. Uh, how about, uh, how about this? How about this? Look at this. Look at a hairy chest. You like that? You like that? You want, you want one of these? And that cast would reunite a few years later for the $71 million grossing sequel, Three Men and a Little Lady. After his ghostly experience on Three Men and a Baby, he would go on to do another movie with ghosts in it, called High Spirits in 1988. It's a wacky fantasy flick where he gets romantic with the dead, but in a fun, silly, 80s kind of way. Oh, and we can't forget the movie Don't Tell Her It's Me, aka The Boyfriend School, which had him sporting a New Zealand accent and a mullet. Then he took a few years off from the big screen to go back to his stage roots, to work on a few Broadway productions, because despite what some may say, he's actually like a real actor, a thespian, an artiste. But Steve Gutenberg would come roaring back to the big screen by playing more mature roles in films aimed at younger audiences, such as his role in the Disney soccer underdog flick, The Big Green. And he joined the ensemble cast of the Christmas film Home for the Holidays, as well as star in the Parent Trap ripoff Olsen Twins movie, It Takes Two. But he got the ultimate seal of stardom, when he was mentioned in one of the best Simpsons episodes ever, the Stonecutters episode, in the song We Do, which perfectly pokes fun at Gutenberg's status as an unlikely superstar. You know, the only explanation for this guy's popularity is that an Illuminati-like organization put him there. LOL. Who makes you Gutenberg? 
But for me, growing up in the 90s, there was no better Steve Gutenberg movie than 1997's Tower of Terror. It was made for ABC's Sunday Night Wonderful World of Disney, and was based off the popular theme park ride. And one has to wonder, is Steve's decision to star in a film about ghosts in Hollywood his subtle, secretive, symbolic way of telling us the truth behind the phantom of three men and a baby? Most likely, definitely, yes, maybe. It's redemption. It'll get me back in the game. People will listen to me again. And seriously, where do I care about some moldy old ghosts? I don't even know. With the 90s coming to a close, Steve Gutenberg would star in one last wide theatrical release, a movie called Zeus and Roxanne, where a dog falls in love with a dolphin. However, Zeus and Roxanne only managed to make 7.2 million at the box office. Zeus and Roxanne, available everywhere videos are sold. And from then on, good old Goots would take his talents directly to video. Kicking things off with a kind of prequel to Casper, called Casper, a spirited beginning. And even the biggest Casper fans hate this fucking movie. He tried to be an action hero in 1998's Airborne. He tried to be a race car driver in Overdrive, also in 1998. And he would try again at the underdog soccer thing again in Home Team, also, also in 1998. From there, good old Gutenberg would spend the next 20 years starring in over 40 direct-to-video or extremely limited released titles. Films like P.S. Your Cat is Dead, the TV movie remake of The Poseidon Adventure, Jessica Simpson's Private Valentine, Blonde and Dangerous, At the Top of the Pyramid, Les Baum, I Love You, and its sequel I Love You Too. <laughs> And Gutenberg did get stuck in that Hallmark Christmas movie mode with two films, Single Santa Seeks Miss Claus and Meet the Santas. Steve Gutenberg, Crystal Bernard. Hey, Mr. Claus. But while Gutenberg was making some questionable film choices, he was also bringing some of that 80s nostalgia to our TV screens. He would be featured on popular TV shows such as Veronica Mars, The Goldbergs, Law and Order, Criminal Intent, Community, and Ballers, as well as appearing as himself on such shows like According to Jim, also playing himself in Party Down, and playing himself again again in The Mysteries of Laura, as well as being a contestant on season six of Dancing with the Stars, where he was eliminated on the show's third episode. OMG. But Steve Gutenberg would fully embrace that sci-fi channel corny movie trend with a movie called Lava Lantula. You know, it's like volcano spiders, basically. It reunites him with some of his Police Academy castmates and got a sequel to Lava to Lantula. And in this beloved Lava Lantula franchise, he plays an aging actor who doesn't know what to do with his career and is the world's only chance at stopping these volcano spider things. And I don't know if you know this, but Lava Lantula exists in the same cinematic universe as Sharknado. You know what? This shows that Steve Gutenberg still likes to have a good time. Movies should be fun. And the first step to making a movie fun is casting a guy who seems like he's having fun. And whether it's Diner, Three Men and a Baby, Police Academy, or Lava Lantula, or two lava, two lantula, Steve is always having fun, which is totally contagious. Viva Los Angelinos! Lava Lantula, a sci-fi original movie. He was featured on Holy Moly in 2020, played a very interesting looking character in a film called Original Gangster in 2021, and appeared in Paper Empire in 2022. Hey, that's this year. So you know what? He's still working. He's still out there doing his thing. And Steve Gutenberg has other projects in the works. And there's rumors out there that Disney is working on a Three Men and a Baby sequel. Sequel? Three Men and a Bride? Because that baby's old enough to get married now. So yeah, those rumors are starting to stir up again, so maybe there's a comeback just around the corner. But you know what? 
he doesn't really need one. His legacy is secure. In Steve Gutenberg's 2012 memoir, The Gutenberg Bible, he opens this book by recalling his first conversation he had with an agent at the age of 16. The agent told him to forget about being an actor, telling him that he doesn't have the right look, didn't have the talent, and his name was ridiculous. Gutenberg. Nearly one billion dollars in box office receipts later, Steve Gutenberg has gotten the last laugh. Some movie stars may head down dark paths when their careers start to mellow out, but Gutenberg has never really been tangled up in any controversy. He lives a humble life with his wife. Gutenberg is involved in several charities, and the people who have known and worked with him over the years have nothing but nice things to say about the guy. So maybe what they say is true. Nice guys do finish last, but that's okay because it's the journey that truly matters. And Gutenberg sure gave us quite the adventure along the way. He has his own production company now, and he even named it after his old high school drama teacher, Mr. Kirby Productions. Relax, relax, right? Relax, ohm, ohm. Gutenberg had his time in the spotlight, and that was plenty. He never burnt out or disgracefully ruined his legacy or annoyed us with too many Gutenbergian performances. You know, to the point where we don't really appreciate them anymore. We were given just enough. Hollywood just kind of kept moving on, and Steve Gutenberg was like, oh, okay, thanks for the fun times. I'm just gonna keep doing my thing. Steve Gutenberg seems to know his place in the history of cinema, and in the zeitgeist of our pop culture. He's never trying to be something he's not, always staying true to himself. And Steve seems to really appreciate the opportunities that he's had in his career. He loves that so many of his films have become classics, but he always humbly never takes credit for their timeless appeal. He's the perfect example of not knowing what you got until it's gone. We didn't truly appreciate what we had when he was around. You know, it's happened to us all. One day you wake up and you just think, hey, you know what, Steve Gutenberg isn't in movies anymore. I miss him. And you know what? That is the genius of Gutenberg, leaving you wanting more. And nobody, not nobody can do it like Steve. So nobody, not nobody should give a fuck about what the fuck happened to Steve Gutenberg, because he's doing just fine.